Welcome to the Cable Stockards podcast, your one-stop shop for all things hybrid and multi-cloud networking. Now, here are your hosts, Tim, Chris, and Alex. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Fortnightly News on the Cables to Clouds podcast. I'm your host this week, Tim, as always, uh, at Juan Golbez on Twitter. And with me, as usual, is my uh, co host, Chris Miles, at BGP Main on Twitter as well. There's no X, and there never was. <laughs> All right, let's jump right into it. Uh, for our first article, uh, we have a. Uh, we have an article from businesswire.com, but it's about the O'Reilly 2024 um, state of state of security survey, which uh, I'd be honest, I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know this existed, but uh, apparently there is an O'Reilly state of security survey. And the, the big finding from here, honestly, um, shouldn't really be a surprise to anyone who is in the industry at this point, the main findings from this industry um, survey, by the way, so O'Reilly being the the publication company like O'Reilly textbooks, they also have you know O'Reilly um, the online you know training platform where you can take classes, read books. Uh, so there, this is their survey, and so it's focused on skills, certifications, and whatnot throughout the industry. And the biggest finding they have, again, not a surprise, is that there's a severe lack of uh, AI security skills. They didn't mention AI um, development skills, which is kind of interesting because I would have thought that would be lo- low as well or, or, or you know, any other, I don't even know what other AI <laughs> um, roles there are at this point, right? But it, and it, probably because this thing was so focused on security, it uh, specifically mentions that AI security is a huge gap. Like, uh, what did they say? They 30... 34% of tech professionals uh, surveyed report a shortage of AI security skill gap. Now that, honestly, I thought it would be a lot higher. AI security is even newer than AI, all the other AI skills, right? We've only started getting into security around things like uh, prompt injection and, you know, things like that, where you can, you know, uh, fix your prompt in such a way that you can pull out data that wasn't necessarily intended to be shared as part of the large language model and stuff like that. So um, honestly, I thought that number would be a, a lot higher. Um, with it, though, interestingly, 38, uh, despite cl- the fact that cloud computing has been around for quite a long time at this point, uh, comparatively, the 39% of respondents identified cloud security as their most significant skill shortage. Now, that one was a bit of a surprise to me, um, given that cloud is... I won't say like super mature, right? I mean, compared and compared to the rest of networking tech, especially, you know, pretty pretty new. But I mean, it's been around like two decades by this point, and and you know, so a huge amount of people are saying cloud security skill gap is still just gigantic. Now, it's not clear if they mean cloud security skills in terms of, um, you know, like people using cloud native services for security or just how to design probably it's probably all of the above, honestly, how to design security for the cloud. Um, yeah. So, so again, two, two, the, the one was surprising. One was not surprising. Uh, interesting survey. Uh, what do you, uh, what, what do you have to say about that, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I actually did download the report and went through it a little bit and yeah, uh, I was surprised that like, well, what one note that they made in here was actually fishing seems to be the top concern, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, I mean, you know, it was, it was like fishing and then network intrusion, ransomware, et cetera. But, you know, like I, I would, a lot of times it seemed like phishing is what led to network intrusion in the first place. So that makes kind of, sense. Kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, the, I'll be honest, the thing about cloud security being a top concern, I, I actually didn't find that surprising at all. I think what I've seen in um, at least in my line of work from from people moving into cloud and, and adopting security practices in the cloud, they're kind of opening the kimono a bit and, and showing their ass, I feel like, because they don't get the uh, implied security of a walled garden that they got in, in their, their traditional networks. And it's a bit jarring to see some of the security practices that are that are not being followed in the cloud just because they don't have the the skills or the the you know kind of the the knowledge to do it 
Um, so I actually didn't find that surprising at all. I think there's, I, I talk to a lot of people um, on a daily basis where they're like, yeah, we're not doing half this stuff just because we, we, we simply haven't had the time to try to implement it. And, hmm. um, you know, there was this big push to move to cloud and, and, you know, we did that, but now that we've kind of taken a step back from a security perspective um, and we're, you know, not doing the ideal things. And, it, you know, there was even a comment in here that, um, you know, it said 81, 88% of people have adopted MFA. That's, that seems, uh, that seems correct. But it also said 49% have adopted a zero trust model. And I wonder. That is insane. <laughs> what do they that, mean by that? <laughs> yeah. They're like, it, that must mean anything under the sun they've done with zero trust. They now have a zero trust model. Cause like, it no, must. We, we were, we were talking about this just a couple of weeks ago. Like no, we've never seen a full a zero trust implementation like to date at all. Like it, I, I don't know if it exists. <laughs> yeah, I I mean the term zero trust of course is so broad anyway, so I right. you kind of wonder if the real answer to that is have you in- implemented any zero trust like like some some small piece of the zero trust uh model or, or something, right? Because or or the people surveyed just didn't know what they meant by zero trust, one of the two because there's no way I, I you know, from all the people that we talk to in our line of work, it's there's just no way that any I don't know of a single place that has a full zero trust implementation right. from, from any of the companies I've worked at. So yeah, totally agreed. It must be in like one piece of it or, or some small part of it. All right. Um, uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring up here from that there's, they're saying the O'Reilly is saying there's still a certification gap, which is interesting because, um, and, and this is, you know, this has to do with the company you keep. I'm in a lot of uh, networking discords and a lot of networking focused, uh, you know, communities and certification is a, a huge, thing there like people are always chasing certifications so again a company you keep i guess i just i i find myself in a place where there's a lot of people looking for certifications i honestly thought it was quite a lot but here they're saying at least for security team members and maybe that's maybe this is the difference right i'm in networking discords um there this this uh, article again from the survey mentions that only about 40 percent of security team mem- team mem- or sorry that there are about 40% of uh, security team members that remain uncertified and with any kind of certification. Now I thought cybersecurity was even more into the certification requirements, you know, lane than uh, networking, you know, cause you want with security, you usually require very strict uh, guidelines, uh, compliance and all of this stuff. But apparently on the certification side, maybe that's, maybe that's not the case. Yeah. It was funny. Cause like in here, it said like of the, of the uh, obvious res- respondents to the survey, the incident responders, 70% of them claim that they were uncertified in, in, you know, in their day-to-day role. Whereas the CISOs only like 30, like a third of them were classified as uncertified. So they have some level of certification, whereas the responders did not. Um, but yeah, that's weird. Uh, that took me by surprise completely. Um, like you said, just as networking is cybersecurity is also a, a place where like everyone like, certifying seems to be the um the immediate kind of bar of entry to get into something like everyone needs to get certified um i mean i I think you and i have been in this game long enough we can easily make the argument that uh, certification does not imply any kind of implementation (laughs) or or like uh you know, it doesn't it doesn't experience yes it does yeah it a hundred percent so but yeah, that was a, that was a very surprising number. All right. Um, so up next, we have an article from CSO Online um, titled Chinese Researchers Break RSA Encryption with a Quantum Computer. Um, so it looks like there has been a research team at Shanghai University that have just as the <laughs> just as the title says, used a, an, a quantum computer to break, um, you know, RSA encryption, which is a very uh, very common and widely adopted um, encryption method for uh, many of the things that we use day to day in, you know, network security, cybersecurity, et cetera. Right. So it's one of the most popular out there. Um, so you know, the, the article kind of gets into you know the the fundamentals of, you know, how quantum computing can do this stuff in a matter of seconds where, or a matter of seconds, whereas, you know, normal computational um, methods would take, you know, potentially years um, to break, you know, a single, single encryption. So 
There's uh, obvious <laughs> obvious concerns with this being something that happens specifically within China um, about the um, global context and, and ramifications from that. Um, you know, kind of talks about the you know the the threat to data security and privacy for enterprises, et cetera. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that you know. They call out the, this need for quantum safe encryption. I don't know how far off we are from getting to that because that seems like my, my brain can barely even understand the the, the the absolute basics of quantum computing. So quantum safe encryption sounds like also something that's just completely well, it's going to be way too much math that I need to understand because I am not smart enough for that. So I'll, uh, I don't know how far off we are from that. But obviously there's, you know, the need is rapidly approaching um, with things like this. I mean, the bar of entry to do things like this is is also relatively high, right? So, like, quantum computers are not cheap. Like, we're we're talking we're still in the days where we're talking about these things cost either low millions or at least hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So, your your common attacker is not going to have access to this stuff. But um, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's 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 not a commodity until it is, right? So, you know, we we obviously need to meet it at a head in some capacity. Um, but, uh, yeah, very, very interesting thing, uh, to think about. So I don't know what's your take, Tim. Yeah. So back in 2019, I was, uh, yeah, actually it might've been before. No, it was 2019. Cause, uh, that, that was the year I spoke at, uh, Cisco live. Um, we, we went to, uh, training for, uh, presentation, presentation training. I, I went to San, uh, was it San Diego or San Jose for a uh, presentation training. And one of the speakers in that cohort, she was giving a talk on quantum computing, breaking uh, cryptography, like, like that mm. and how, how simple it would be essentially for math based uh, encryption to be broken by quantum computing. So this is back in 2019. Right. Mm. And uh, so this isn't surprising. Um, however, there is one thing, one one small ray of light. Yes, it was broken, but um, this was a 22-bit in, integer, right? So this is like the very low, like, uh, and that, that's not to say, it doesn't mean, right? With enough time and enough resources, all things are possible. Um, and like you said, probably the only people that are going to have access to the kind of computing power to really, really slog at a, at a, uh, a powerful encryption model are going to be states, like nation states, like, China, for example, or, you know, the U S or, or what, whatnot. Um, yeah, it's a matter of time, but all encryption is a matter of time, right? Every, everything that's ever been encrypted is, is a matter of time before somebody can break it all the way back to Caesar cipher. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's, it's a milestone, which probably bears paying attention to, especially who's doing it. Um, we're not, you know, we're not out of the woods or we're not into the woods yet, but neither are we going to be out of the woods yet. Like you said, uh, I, I asked about quantum safe encryption. Like what is, what does quantum safe encryption look like? And, uh, I forget who I was talking to, but somebody said basically it's actually kind of dumbing down, like using like different kinds of encryption that aren't, that aren't, um, advanced math based, like, and that actually mm. defeats a lot of quantum encryption because the, the, remember the point of quantum encryption is the, how quickly it can do the math required to break the encryption, right? So if you're not using math or, or something, I don't know. This has been a couple of years now since I asked about this. I have to go look it up. But there are quantum encryption. My understanding is that there are quantum safe encryption methods. They're not just going to be bigger and bigger numbers, right? Because at some point that would become computationally painful for anyone. Like your Cisco router, your anything that does encryption, it would become too computationally painful to, to move packets. Uh, as an example from a networking perspective. So yeah, interesting, good milestone. Um, not that worried yet. We're talking about 22 bit integer, but yeah, definitely worth paying attention to because that's what China's working on. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously if you think about a 22 bit integer, that's like, Oh, like we're, we're thinking of cracking passwords, right? That's, that's probably the easiest line to draw there. But, um, you know, I think this is probably much more, like you said, uh, focused on, the real threat, which is like nation states, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure Department of Defense, things like that. that is, that's where these things kind of become relatively serious. But I'm, I'm curious, like, uh, I'm 
this is just in my own head, but I'm, I'm thinking like quantum safe encryption. If the, if the method is to kind of dumb it down and not use this in, you know, insane level of mathematical computation. Um, I wonder how that pairs with AI and how easy it is for generative AI to solve the, the, the kind of dumb human part of it. You know what I mean? Um, and, and factor that in, I mean, I could be oversimplifying it for sure, but, um, I wonder if those two things going together make it also even more difficult. Yeah, it's a really good question. But I, I mean, I've, I've heard that generative AI specifically is extremely bad at, uh, like there it's, it's decently good at explaining how math works, but apparently it's quite bad at actually doing math. So I'm, I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. Now that one could cover the other, I don't, I don't actually know. It's a good question. Um, but it's moving in a direction that's a little, it's all moving in a bit of a concerning direction. Yeah. hundred percent. Only time will tell. All right. Uh, next, um, yeah, so this this next episode um, episode next article comes from CIO Dive, and uh, it's enterprises are clinging to mainframes as uh, the cloud expands. This is this was an interesting article, not surprising, especially if you listen to the show for a while. Um, but there is a combination of a few things, right? For, first of all, IBM and and other mainframe developers are still developing mainframes, like mainframes. There's actually still new new mainframes coming out, new mainframe models coming out. And a lot of enterprises are basically at the point where they need to start doing tech refresh on this stuff or where they need to uh, start doing tech refresh stuff on this or just, you know, migrating away or refactoring or whatever. Most enterprises, uh, probably 99% of them, have not gotten to the point where they can refactor an app away from a mainframe, right? Like they, they Either they don't have the skills to do it, they don't have the money to do it. Refactoring is actually extremely expensive. It's all it's often more expensive than just starting over with a new off the shelf or you know developed app. Um, so anyway, point is the these enterprises basically well you've got old mainframes and they're out of tech, uh, they're out of support, just like all hardware gets. So they actually have to <laughs> start paying money to refresh we'd probably consider to be ancient tech at this point. Um, but they're doing it because those apps cannot be refactored or it makes no sense to migrate them to the cloud for like the kind of app, the kind of app they do. So you have companies like uh, Accenture and IBM and whatnot doing things like mainframe as a service, like offering, like managing the mainframe uh, for these companies um, that is very popular as well. You know, if they don't want to just go buy new mainframes, they could do mainframe as a service. But the mainframes, the point is the mainframes are not going away, despite the fact that a lot of enterprises are still trying to move ahead with modernizing apps and moving some of it to the cloud. And the good, uh, the good news, I think, is enterprises are learning which apps belong in the cloud and which apps don't belong in the cloud. And that's part of what this article touches on as well, is that there are apps that, first of all, can't be refactored and you can't do anything about that. But also there's just some apps that just don't work well in the cloud. And the, the article mentions this. So what we're seeing is, is kind of a weird uh, thing where, you know, originally CIOs and above were sold this bill of goods that, you know, we're going to be able to close your data centers. And it never was that simple. but um, yeah, so it's like we've said from the beginning, right? Some apps belong in the cloud, some apps don't. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I don't really find this overly surprising. Like you said, you know, there's there's a lot of existing mainframes that are out of support now. And, um, you know, the, the adoption of these mainframe as a service offerings, you know, if, if people can do things as a service to avoid, you know, their own <laughs> kind of fixing their own skeletons in their own closet, you know, that's usually what they'll do. Um, so I'm not surprised by that, especially I haven't been hearing a lot of rumblings lately about how valuable it is to actually be um, like an operator skilled in maintaining mainframes. Um, I feel like I hear about that way more often now for some reason. Um, so this, this kind of does make sense. Um, I mean, I guess the, the mainframe operator is just the, you know, cobalt, developer of, of yeah, today, right? I guess, yeah. <laughs> like you become this like very specialized unicorn that, you know, people, and like you said, these apps can't be refactored. It's not, it makes more sense to pay someone an exuberant amount of money to maintain the existing infrastructure rather than to um, pay to, to refactor it or, you know, kind of re rewrite the application from scratch. Right. So yeah, not surprising at all to me. 
Yeah. Um, the COBOL thing is, is right on, right? Like there's this anachronistic thing where um, old technology that is just part of either infrastructure or finance or something that just simply cannot ever have downtime or never fail simply persists forever. Right. And then, so, and the skill set goes away as people move on to other technologies and there's a, there's a tiny little niche for people that want to make exorbitant amounts of money, knowing tech dead technologies that I don't know. I kind of wonder what that looks like. Do you just like start a contracting company and just say like, Hey, I know, I know mainframes and then <laughs> shop yourself around to enterprises that need that service. Like it's interesting. I mean, there's maybe that's the, maybe that's one way to make money. Just put mainframe in the name. Yes. One of the consulting companies called, let's make sure it says mainframe. The mainframe consulting. Mainframe consulting. We consult mainframes. Nice. Okay. All right. So to wrap up today, we uh, we last have an article. This one's uh, this one's quite. Uh, it's got a it's got an on, ominous uh, tone to it. Um, uh, so it's published on TechSpot.com, and it's about um, this concept of a zero click internet. So what that means is, you know, the it it starts by pointing out that the web is kind of changing the way that. Uh, or the web is changing in a way and on how content is presented and how it's accessible to um, those that are viewing it. So talking about things like Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all that, you know, they don't really promote posts that have, you know, links in them to external things. So they're, they're more focused on generating the content in inside of their own platform. And they promote that just to kind of keep you locked into the platform as long as possible. Um, and now kind of with this, concept of gen AI being brought into the mix, you know, there's this, you know, that content is just going to grow exorbitantly um, because it can, it can automatically, you know, anything that you're putting in can automatically be pulled from the existing platform. So it talks about how, you know, there, there's a future where, you know, you're, you're consuming things on Google and TikTok and like, you don't have to actually leave those platforms ever, right. To, to get all the answers and all the content that you need. Um, and it's, it's funny, he like th- 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 there's no there's no speculative uh, tone to this article whatsoever. It's all like it's always like domain names will no longer have any value um, since visiting. Uh, this is a quote: since visiting websites will no longer be significant force in the most internet traffic. Uh, web hosting businesses um, are pretty much done for. Um, uh, the, it says the independent I- internet advertising business is also done for SEO industry is also doomed. Like this is, he just like kind of runs down the game. Yeah. Like, this is fucked. This is fucked. Like, no, this is, there's uh but like he, he calls out that there's, you know, the end of digital publishers, like the, their days are pretty much numbered on this kind of thing. But you know, Tim and I, you were, you were, uh, or yeah, yeah. Tim and I were kind of riffing on this before we hit record. And like, I don't understand how that's even possible because, you know, as you pointed out, Tim, like the, if, if the current publishing businesses are the source of the content, if they go away, where's AI going to pull the existing content? Well, I guess eventually, I guess it'll all be on, <laughs> on the existing platform that it's pulling it from right so uh maybe it maybe it will start to kind of eat its own tail or something i, I don't know where that comes in yeah from. that's what it is it's it ends up eating its own tail like i mean like it's already doing there's already work to try to keep ai from essentially ingesting its own content and lowering and lowering the resolution yes uh yeah so i don't i don't know um you know it kind of gets he even calls out this this we didn't cover this on the show but we kind of talked about uh he makes reference to this ongoing feud with WordPress. And he's like, you know, he's like the, the actual, that, that I don't know why they're even having this argument because WordPress doesn't have, <laughs> doesn't have a place in this zero click internet. So it's like, it's a, it's not a worthwhile fight to have, which is, uh, which is funny, a very, very interesting read. Uh, I'll give it that. Uh, yeah. I mean, so I hate articles that present the future as a foregone conclusion like they like like i'm the prognosticator of prognosticators and this is the future and thou shalt like it's because it's so i don't know what to say it's just arrogant i don't know <laughs> um but yeah i also i have to point out the 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 irony that 
you know, he's talking about how digital publishers are going away and this is a TechSpot article. Like it's posted <laughs> yeah, on <right>. TechSpot. <laughs> yeah. No digital publishers. It's all gone forever. By the way, this is, this is a TechSpot article. So, um, I don't know what the, like, I don't know what else to say about it. It's the, the claim is a little bit ridiculous. I think there will be, I mean, we're already seeing it when you do Google search results, right? AI is trying to answer your question before you ever hit a link. It'll give you the links after, right? But anybody who's done a Google search recently sees that the first thing that Google tries to do is answer your question um, based on the lar- some large language model. But like, where do you think that a- answer is coming from? It, it, it didn't, Google's not, you know, cutting it from whole cloth, right? That someone out there has answered this question on the internet somewhere in a content piece, in a blog, in a freaking stack overflow. Like these things go away and... Now what? Now where does AI get its content from? It's absolutely ridiculous. So I think we'll see more closer. I think we'll see more of a zero click internet on the platforms that want to keep you tied to them. Like that they will try to do that. But the idea of a completely zero click internet is absolutely ridiculous. All right. And with that, uh, that wraps up our news episode. Uh, we didn't have a, yeah, it was a bit of a, a slow two week period, but don't give, it'll uh, it'll be getting a lot faster as we get uh, a lot more probably as we get closer to uh, November uh, and to uh, December for reInvent. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter that we don't have. Make, <laughs> make sure you follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, and uh, LinkedIn and and uh, TikTok. Make sure you follow us on TikTok as well. Yes, uh, yes. The most important one, uh, buy our cereal, um, buy the home game. You can play at home <laughs> with your family. Yeah. One of you can be Chris and one of you can be me. Uh, that's join, really us, the- join us on the zero click internet. Um, yeah. The zero click internet. That's where I'm migrating to actually. I'm migrating my <laughs> yeah, blog yeah. to zero click internet. <laughs> so make sure you find it on there as well. All right. And with that, we'll go ahead and let it go. Have a good uh, week guys. Hi everyone, it's Tim, and this has been the Cables to Clouds podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe to us in your favorite podcast catcher, as well as subscribe and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel to be notified of all our new episodes. Follow us on socials at Cables to Clouds. You can also visit our website for all the show notes at cables2clouds.com. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.